Hello and my name is Rob. And I'm Rob. And welcome to the return of Impossible Mission. I, I started it a little bit weirdly there, like I've forgotten what, who I was and where I was and what I was doing. You're Rob. And I know that much. <laughs> but it's been like since, what, like mid-December, the last time we recorded one of these. And today it's like the 22nd of February, so it's a little time. Yeah, we did have a, re- a, a rather extended hiatus while we just kind of, well, there, there's there's lots of reasons. Yeah, we went on walks in the park and and we serenaded by chipmunks that somehow, for some reason, have really high pitched voices. What happened oh, what, to those chipmunks on that cartoon, oh, Rob? Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You're making this sound like some weird version of Lady in the Tram, in which case, I am not Lady. <laughs> No. Yeah, I was kind of suggesting you were the other one, to be honest. I am happy to be the tramp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, joking to one side, joking to one side. But yeah, we did promise before the new year that this was going to be an on-camera piece. Um, no, it doesn't need to be. we got news trash to fill that void. We're just going to continue rambling on, but it is going to be part of the podcast feed so news trash and impossible mission will team together to make the omnizord or something the I mega the next. megazord you're talking about power rangers aren't you it's a tortured power rangers stuff. analogy it's it's it's, like, it's a really tortured power rangers analogy you're on about a megazord <laughs> i was a he-man and turtles kid and i wasn't <laughs> and baker mice from mars okay um I'm, now now I you're was, hitting I, I, now you're hitting the age, the age when I was at university and Biker Mice from Mars was on and I watched it, but not for the same reasons that you did. Yeah, I was I was a ni- I'm a nineties kid, so with that, I don't know how I was segueing out of that, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> I'm gonna try. Um yeah. Burden of choice. <laughs> there we yeah, go. yeah, yeah. I, I didn't I, I, d- I didn't really segue <laughs> out of it. Like, there was lots of cartoons in the nineties. I loved cartoons in the nineties. There were so many cartoons I didn't know where to begin. There we go. Uh, yeah. a retroactive segue. <laughs> Just crowbar that in there. Um, yeah, bird of choice. It's it's a weird thing to take note of, but it exists now. I think more than ever so before in video games. I mean, I, going back to when I was a kid playing video games, there weren't many video games that you had access to. They were rare and they were expensive and you had limited access. And so we all knew the titles that we all wanted to play. And everybody please, wanted to play the please, same titles. Please don't, please don't turn this into Old Man River. No, I'm not turning it into Old Man River. I'm just ma- giving context to the way things are now. Um, when you know, when I was growing up, and again, when it came to the 90s, when you were in the consoles and stuff like that as well, we all knew because there, there were only a limited number of games, weren't there? We weren't yeah. flooded with game after game after game. There wasn't a new. There weren't like half a dozen new games coming out every single day. Yeah, yeah. And, and that wasn't like the the angle that I was really playing, um, pushing forward. This, I mean, there is that aspect to it. There is the aspect of there's more games than ever. There's thousands upon thousands of titles on Steam and PlayStation and and Nintendo and Microsoft. That's and not the issue. That's just the consoles. The- that's not even even including mobile platforms. Yeah, you know, mobile gaming is largely pointless because it's well, just it's, all it's all gacha or match three or microtransaction heavy and yeah, but microtransaction are, heavy, microtransaction heavy where it basically makes FIFA look quite conservative. Yeah, but the thing is, even with all of those, you still get some games that are actual died in the wall games, um, and that's the thing. A lot of these games are because of the microtransactions. They're being offered for free. Um, there's all of that, all of that being released. But the, the sort of the core facet of what this episode is about, it's about sort of subscription services. Um, I've got to relate it to movies because I I'm a subscriber by proxy to Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime, and Disney Plus, and I'm tying up and I am tying up getting Shudder as well. And honestly, it, it comes to a point where it gets to the time of the evening. I think, ah, I'm going to put a movie on. I load up Amazon Prime. I think, uh, too long, uh, too long, uh, too long. Then I close that. I open up Netflix. Uh, it's all TV. Can't be bothered. 
Then they open up Disney Prime, no Disney Plus. Nothing on there yet. Nothing. It hasn't been upgraded yet. Uh, so I go back to Amazon Prime and I watch Futurama or South Park or something because there's so much choice. I just can't be bothered. That's yeah. happening with video games now. With the likes of Games Pass and PlayStation Now. If PlayStation Now was actually any good, I mean before that, you know. Uh, PS PlayStation Plus is giving you games. Uh, the Epic Store is giving you games. Amazon is giving you games. Everybody is giving you games. Yeah, and that's just those platforms that are giving you free games. That's not including just the literal sheer weight of games that are available that you can buy. That's just the free ones that that are being given to you, or the ones that you're getting for free for free. I use that term very loosely as part of your subscription. And this is kind of the point I was getting to with what I was saying. Um, with what I was saying about when we were growing up, we had a limited number of games. Because we didn't have subscription services or anything like that. And so we never had to suffer this kind of kid in the candy store where your eyes are just so large and you can't actually decide. Because there's just so much choice. Yeah. And that's a problem, I think. Because... On, on, let's just talk about Games Pass because it is the thing which is at the heart of this for me. Games Pass, I don't think, is all that great on the premise that it's not going to be helpful for people who are making these in, small independent games. I, I, when you break it down in the economics of Games Pass, the lion's share of the money that a games developer gets for being on Games Pass will go to... Uh, the big games, the AAA games, the games that get people through the door. The likes of the Gunk or Steam World Dig or uh, no, Inside don't get people to subscribe to Games Pass. Hmm. Red Dead Redemption does, Borderlands do. And proportionally, the indie games aren't going to get a lot of financial reward. And time-wise, the indie games are going to be a bit more buried. See, this is the thing... Um, uh just so it's, like, it's like a separate issue. It's like a yeah, like a adjacent issue. Yeah, it's an adjacent issue. The weird thing is, the weird thing is, because I actually do uh, do re- understand, recognize what you what you're talking about in terms of promotion. Game Pass, I think, um, needs a lot of work in order to be helpful for indie devs. The kind of uh, just playing devil's advocate for a second there, um, it has been reported. That Games Pass could be very helpful to indie devs, especially to small studios, because it can basically make the process of getting their game out simpler than it is on other platforms. Which you know, yeah. uh, and that, I think that the two can't work together. You can't make it simpler for indie devs to get their games onto a platform or out to a wider audience, but then not actually work to promote those games. You you know, not put them not put them in a place. On your storefront, where they're going to get attention. Do you see what in I mean? In the irony is, uh, compared to PlayStation Now, Games Pass is the best case scenario, but even then, I don't think it's great because hmm. by the sheer um, metrics of the amount of games that have been released, yeah, you're missing like 90% of what's out there. Oh, I mean, Steam suffers from the same problem. Um, when you look at the Steam storefront, what you'll see on the Steam storefront, right on the first page, are all of the things that you know, are popular and, you know, uh, or have made a name for themselves through marketing or whatever, you won't see the things that maybe you want to pay attention to or that you're looking for straight away. You'll have to dig through uh, pages of Steam to find a game that might catch your interest. There might be, you might have a specific interest in a specific type of game, but you might have to go through a couple of pages before you find any games that that fit your criteria. Yeah, and uh, just I don't know how Games Pass works, whether it you add things to lists or whatever. But that same sort of idea is there. You know, you're yeah. gonna you're going through Games Pass. You think, oh, that's on Games Pass. I'll download that. Oh, that's on Game Pass. I'll download that. And by the end of it, you've got a hundred gigabyte uh, hard drive full of uh, games. And where'd you begin? So instead of like looking at those games that you've got and you subscribe to you're just going to end up gravitating to something because you can't be bothered with anything else because you you end up circling that you know 
drain. You think, oh, well, should I play that? Eh, can't be bothered. It's uh, well, it's a bit too. The nights are a bit too short. Yeah, um, I'm tired. Uh, I know. I've people. had a long day, and then right. you just uh, you got all this this available, and you just think, you know what? I'll just play FIFA. <laughs> See, the, there's a big irony in what you've just said, um, but. It, and the irony, uh, part of the irony is that what you said is the truth. Um, I know people who have, uh, you know, uh, the new consoles and, uh, like, on the Series X, uh, a few people I know have literally hundreds of games already downloaded and installed on their machines. And when I ask them how many they play, they say, um, three or four. Yeah, I mean, what's the point, you know? And my second question has to be, that, see, that's the thing. My second question to them is, well, why did you download so many games? It seemed like a good idea at the time is probably the most common reason given. You're just drowning in stuff. And yeah, and this is a separate issue, I think. But for me personally, the reason why I can't really invest in that that sort of infrastructure, that Game Pass, that subscription service for all your games infrastructure mm-hmm. is, is fundamentally because I don't think you value stuff as much when you are not paying like the money to get in the door. Yeah, you're not. And the bizarre thing is, right, um, remember years ago I said to you, everyone is a collector of something? Yeah. Okay. It suddenly strikes me through what we're talking about, and I've literally just had this thought, it suddenly strikes me that this whole subscription service, because I've seen people do this with Netflix, and I've seen people do this on uh, on Mal and on various other websites where you can basically um, record what you've watched, stuff like that. It's a form of collection. It's a form of proving, you know, the, your worth uh, by having this here and showing it off to people. Look how many things I've got on my on my list, look how many games I've got installed on my machine. Do you see what I mean? Well, that's getting into an entirely separate issue altogether. That but, sort of strain into sort of like uh, tre- achievements and trophies, which not so much the, the achievements and trophies, but just saying, but it has I've got same, same sort of idea. Yeah, you know. I've got this many games installed on my machine. I've watched this many anime. I've seen this many films because um, oh, you're on that where, whatever that website is where Let, you record letterbox. Letterbox, yeah. And, you know, there are people who basically just checkmark every single film they've watched. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? It's a form of collection. Yeah, but the point is, you know, when you're paying, like, let's say, $60 or hmm. £60 for a game, you you feel like you owe it to yourself to get try and get as much out of that game as you possibly can. Yeah. You might not finish it, but you get as much out of it as you can manage. Whereas, because... It kind of trivialises the fact that you own it a little bit more because you don't actually own it. You're just sort of renting it from blockbusters. Yeah. So if you, if you don't like it within sort of an hour or so, you think, you know what, I've got another 100 games. I'll put this one, I'll delete this one off my hard drive and just try one of those other 99. So again, we come back to the main reason why, um, why I prefer physical copies of games. Um, because, number one, I actually own that copy of the game. So if I want to if I want to uninstall that game from my machine, I can, but I haven't lost it because I cancelled some sc- subscription service. It's still there. It's fine, you know, having the burden of choice. But I think it's here's going to be a generalization that might I maybe shouldn't do. But when you get older, you got to pick your time, you got to pick your games, and you got to spend get your worth out of the games because you know you only get a, a game for a few hours a day after work or because you got kids or whatever. The idea of having hundreds of games and playing all your hundreds of games is kind of a bit younger. It's a bit younger skewing. Is it? The yeah. value of that is very much younger skewing. Yeah, um, I don't think that's a generalization. I'd say that's a pretty. I, I'd say in terms of generalizations. Uh, that one is probably more accurate than most. There are a lot of people who fall into uh, who fall into the you know over thirties gamer category, who just simply don't have the time to play games for ten hours a day, twelve hours a day. Because people don't the, play it that long, do they? There are people who basically who basically spend all day playing games, and I don't understand. Uh, well, I do understand the the lure of playing games all day, but I I just I couldn't bring myself to do it because there are too many things that I would class as 
more important than yeah, but video we're kind games. Of getting, getting away from the point there a little bit. Because uh, this is a video game show. I mean, yeah. video, having choice is great, but Just, where does choice start and being drowned in options begin? Just just on that point, right? I, I already said I prefer physical copies of games. One of the reasons why I prefer physical copies of games, because like you, I've got Netflix, I've got Amazon Prime, I've got Disney Plus. You know, oh, just on that point before you go any further, I yeah. have those. Yeah. But I would much rather have the movies on there on disc so I can do it whenever I want. See, this is my point. Again, you're kind of you're jumping ahead of me. You've got to stop thinking like me. Um, <laughs> well, it's not really thinking like you. It's kind of a common thing. We constantly hear that physical things are dead, that people don't collect things anymore. But that's not true. For God's sake, vinyls made a resurgence. And so have cassettes. I've already you established stuff. Look, I've already established all of this thing where you go on to like Netflix or Amazon Prime or wherever, or you go on to Game Pass and you start check marking all the games that you've got or that you own or that you've played. You know, all this trophy hunting thing. It's just another form of collection. So anyone who says you, that people that people who collect things, you know, they don't exist. You know, it, it, it's a fallacy. Anyway, here's the thing, right? If you want a physical copy of a game and you have it like a shelf of games that you own, yeah? If you want to play a game and you don't have any subscription service, if you want to play a game, you'll pick one off your shelf, you'll install that game. You absolutely want to play that game because you've taken the time to pick it off your shelf, put it in, put the disc in, install the game, and sit down and play the game. So that means you don't have that burden of choice because you've already made your decision, you know which game you want to play. Yeah, uh, the thing is... As, go- as many positives as we, we can do in, in a, a version of this show where we basically say our burden of choice is amazing and it opens up so many different games that you wouldn't try or you don't have, have the budget to, to have a go because, you know, yeah, money's finite and we can only stretch it so far. So people tend to stray towards the big games and, you know, dabble a little bit with a lot of littler ones when there's, like, quieter periods. Yeah. But having, like, a subscription like Games Pass allows you to have bo- best of both worlds. But at the same time... Having everything available at the touch of a button is overwhelming. Yeah, and I'm, it literally it, is the kid in the candy store. And I, I'm going to stretch this analogy a little bit because it's already started happening. That whole thing about the kid in the candy store, you know when they get overwhelmed by choice and they just start bawling their eyes out because they can't actually make a decision? Doesn't hmm. that describe several things that have started happening amongst the gaming community more recently? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all wish we were dogs, and like you know, when you put <laughs> all of the food in front of a dog, the dog will yeah. eat it all. Yeah, but we can't be like that. It's just it's but, not possible. But the thing is, a kid can't do that because a kid understands that there, you know, a child understands that there are limitations. It's only allowed like maybe one or two sweets in this entire shop full of sweets, but it can't decide which one it wants, and so it starts crying its eye uh, its eyes out. That's <laughs> that is that is certain sections of the gaming community. You know which sections I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, a new part of the show. Yes, uh, which we want you to get involved with if you are watching or listening on the podcast feed. If you listen on the podcast feed, get like head to the geek show You'll find all our social links there. Get in touch with us through the social links there. But this is a part of the show that we're finishing on called Game Fights. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. So the whole idea of this is we... Uh, the current topic is burden of choice, yeah? So with all of these games available, how do you decide what to play? So the idea here is which game do you return to with so many games available? Which game do you constantly go back to? Um, regardless of whether it's, you know, every few weeks, every few days, every few months, there, there'll be one game that no matter what, no matter what other games you played in, in the interim period, you'll always go back to that game. And it could just be for a day, it could just be for an hour, it could be for a few days or even a week. And then you'll put it down, you'll go away, you'll play other things, but then you'll come back to it again later on. Which yes. game is that for you? Well, you go first. See, bizarrely enough, for me... I had to go with FIFA. <laughs> and yeah, I thought about it. Good like that, yeah. See, this is the thing. I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. And I thought, what game do I always go back to? And I didn't even think about FIFA. For a long yeah. time, I did not even think about 
of FIFA, I thought about all sorts of other games. I thought about, I even thought about games like uh, Gran Turismo Spartan, you know, even games that I play on my mobile phone. But then I thought, hang on, every time I go back and play FIFA for like a few days and then I'll put it down and I'll go do other things. But every single time I'll go back and play FIFA. It's you kind know, of a it, boring answer, but it's boring because it's kind of accurate. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Uh, it, you know, it, I, I could make up all, you know, all sorts of other uh, reasons for other games, but if we're talking like a bread and butter game, something that I will always go back to and always sit down and play, it's FIFA. Mm. Yeah, so that's you. Um, me, The Witcher 3, Wild Hunt. Really? Yeah, I'm on my fourth playthrough. Wow. Yeah, I know I shouldn't. <laughs> I know it's really long. I know it's really long. <laughs> But at the same time, uh, it's the characters. Yeah. They feel so... You know when you watch, like, a sitcom? Yeah. Uh, say, like, Futurama? Yeah. And they do a great job of making you feel like you're one of the gang. Yeah. Like, you're really disheartened and upset when the series finishes, finishes because, you know, those characters were your friends and you never see them again. Yeah. The Witcher has that sort of uh, attachment to me. I I love The Witcher because I feel like uh, I know these characters. I feel like I'm part of this world. And just visiting them again, it, it brings... Uh, it warms the cockles of me heart. If the heart has cockles, I don't think it does. I think cockles are related. I think they're a kind of crustacean. But I move on. <laughs> yeah, I never understood that phrase, it warms the cockles of me heart. I... Why don't you yeah. uh, I mean, go the whole hog and say barnacles? My heart has ba- uh, barnacles of the heart. It just yeah, it doesn't. doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> but yeah, that's what really. I keep on going back to The Witcher over and over again because I feel like it's part of. Uh, I belong to that world. I feel a really close friendship and kinship with that world. Yeah. If you go back in past generations, I felt exactly the same about Mass Effect 2 and 3. The amount of times I replayed those beggars. Oh my. Oh my. And because, yeah, I'd probably say a Mass Effect if it was one like worth release this generation, but there wasn't. So, and Mass and the Witcher just kind of came in and f- filled up that hole and filled up that desire. See, it's me. the bizarre thing is for those of us who, for those people who know us personally, right? They probably would have switched our choices around. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's that's the big irony here is that. Uh, most people would have had you as playing FIFA regularly and me as playing The Witcher regularly. Yeah, well, it's one of my top five games that I've ever played, The Witcher 3. See, this is the thing. Most FIFA games aren't don't even enter my top ten, but I think, it's for me, it's the just the pick-up-and-play aspect of it. You know? Yeah, um, I, I don't know how we're going to sort of conclude this aspect of Movie Fight, so, um, yeah, comment below on which you think is the better sort of uh, pick. For a movie fight, or game fight, I should say. Yeah. There's not a right answer, but, uh, but there's a... I was going to say, movie fight is someone else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, movie fight is the podcast which just stole this idea from. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yes. Uh, comment below in which you uh, which you feel like you uh, gravitate to more. Yeah. There, there we go. That's a good way to round it off. So, I think that's it for the first returned episode of possible mission isn't it yeah if you like the video then give us a thumb a sub or a bell and if you want to see more videos like this then uh, please support us on patreon the details are in the description that's it from impossible mission for this week join us every other thursday for more video game chit chat until next time thanks for watching